Hey, I'm uh, Jeff Miller. I'm the director of Alameda Creek Lines. I'm actually the founder, and um, I want to just take a minute and reflect on, uh, I started working on Alameda Creek Steel at Restoration 25 years ago, and I just want to take a moment and appreciate where we are today, um, and just, you know, by all the stakeholders in this room, and all the, all the projects that are going forward. Um, pretty, pretty amazing moment, hopefully a turning point for, for some of our native fish, and just for watershed restoration appreciation. So. Thank you, thank you, everyone um, who's had a had a hand in it. Just pretty much all of you here. Um, I assume most people in this room know pretty know, know the watershed pretty well and um, know the history of restoration. But I'm going to take you on a pretty fast um, whirlwind tour of the last 25 years of restoration. Talk a little bit about um, where it's put us now and and. Um, what we, what we need to do going forward, um, and which will segue into um, Stephen Cochran's to talk about um, some of the monitoring we're going to be, uh, the monitoring program we're trying to set up for um, salmon and steelhead in the watershed. So uh, I, won't, I won't go into the watershed now. I see most of you are pretty familiar with the watershed. Um, obviously, we had, um, historically, we had anatomist fish runs, including. Um, we are, we are the only interior basin in San Francisco Bay that has historical evidence of cubo salmon, which are typically more on the coastal, you know, redwood, redwood uh, fog influenced streams. Um, we actually had native Chinook salmon. These were part of the, uh, the Central California coast Chinook population. Um, those, those fish in the cubo are long gone, probably never to return to Alameda Creek. Um, the cubo are very scarce uh, in Marin. Long East Creek and even scarcer on the San Mateo coast. So we're not getting those fish back. The Chinook, we um, also will probably never get back. Um, wild Central California coast Chinook spawn in the Russian River and uh, Long East Creek, but uh, I don't think we'll ever get those back in, in Alameda Creek. We do get the hatchery stray fish though um, from Central Valley hatcheries. And in the Guadalupe River uh, in the South Bay, those fish are, are reproducing. So. Um, we, we think we probably would have that in, in Alameda Creek also. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, steelhead trout. Up until the, um, the 60s and, and possibly even until 1972, which is when the flood control channel was done and the bark weir went in and completely cut off um, anatomous fish migration. But we do have, you heard earlier about um, how Alameda Creek has one of the most diverse native fish assemblages in the Bay Area. Um, I think uh, Ed talked about eight native fish. Those are native fish that are regularly found during surveys. There's additional fish that are a little rarer, but you can see we've got a lot of native fish species in the watershed. We have lost some. I talked about the coho and the chinook, um, but we do we do still have amazing both warm water and cold water habitat. So we we formed in 1997, which was the year the steelhead trout um, in our region, that's the Central Coast um, uh, steelhead population, was listed under the Endangered Species Act, and we were we're an effort to do something locally about a bigger, you know, much bigger problem from climate change to to uh, urbanization and all you know dams, dams and water use. Um, but we've been we've been working for 25 years to try to get um, steelhead back in the watershed. And starting in 1999, all the, um, basically every stakeholder in the watershed that manages either land or water um, or has some stake um, has been involved in the fisheries restoration work group and working cooperatively, um, mostly focused on fish passage, um, but also cooperating on restoration, um, stream flows, and, and some other, other uh, issues. And the work group has been um, uh, kind of sponsoring or, or um, you know, ensuring that the science that gets us to, um, to restoration, what we're restoring has been done from everything from genetic analysis of our, of our fish to you know, a, a report um, that kind of turned the tide, certainly with Alameda County Water District. Um, can, can it be done? Can we restore a steelhead to the watershed? Which was an open question when we first started. So we, we focused early on on fish rescue. You know, we had an ad, we had adult steelhead, um, you know, blocked at the bar weir, um, and uh, we did a lot of very dramatic fish rescues. 
Um, it was great publicity for, for the restoration, but also kind of highlighted the need for permanent fish passive solutions. Um, so uh, I got to catch my first steelhead during the rescues. Um, I understand steelhead fishers now. And, uh, you know, fish, we would catch fish, um, the park district and Alameda County Water District um, would cooperate in helping us capture these fish. They're, they're way smarter than we are. We captured very few of them. Um, we would radio tag them, or actually the park district would radio tag them, and then um, track some migration. It started out as a kind of a rescue operation, and, and honestly, it was kind of a little bit of a publicity, political action as well to, to um, spur the, the fish passage projects that needed to happen. And it, it transformed more into a, a bit of a research project. Um, we actually got radio tags on some fish um, and uh, trying to find out where they're going, how long it's taken them. Um, so, but the results um, in, in over two decades of, um, of monitoring the weir, believe me, we, some of us were out there after every storm. We actually had a, a, a live video cam that was trained on the weir for a while, a remote camera, which we could spot fish from. Um, we got out there every opportunity we could, um, the park district to try to capture fish and tag fish. And over two decades, we tagged 35 steelhead. steelhead. Um, we got some really in interesting information from that. Um, one of the things being that a lot of our steelhead, which were then hand moved or truck them above the two rubber dams, most of them were released in Lower Niles Canyon, a couple were released at the base of Stony Brook Creek. But a lot of those fish went up to Stony Brook Creek, which has um, good, good, limited but good habitat and has a uh, resident uh, native rainbow trout population. So um, that pointed out that that's a very, potentially very important tributary for us. But it also really pointed out that um, we need permanent fish passive solutions. And so that's what we've been working on um, the last 20 years. Um, starting with dam removals, most of you know about this. East Bay Park District, the low hanging fruit. We started backwards in this watershed. We started with the smallest, um, most upstream fish barriers. We saved the, the biggies, the most important ones for last. Um, but uh, they were removed from the small regional wilderness. San Francisco had old infrastructure, Niles and small dams that were, frankly, were liabilities to them um, and uh, also could be taken out, no longer used for water supply. So um, Niles Dam from, from Niles Canyon and Snow Dam up at the top of Niles Canyon were taken out in 2006. Uh, ACWD decided um, they could do their recharge operations um, without one of the rubber dams, so elected to remove their lower rubber dam back in 2009, I think um, uh, you, you heard from Leonard about the, the cement sill was left and then notched with a little fish ladder in it. Um, Lawrence Livermore Lab, they removed a stream crossing up. This is in the Royal Mocho. Um, the Royal Mocho Gorge is an interesting potential future um, steelhead area. It's got resident rainbow trout, it's got foothill alley frogs, but it's uh, highly disconnected from the rest of the watershed. Um, fish would have to get through um, urban uh, flood control channels in Livermore and Pleasant and Pleasant Livermore to get up there. So, but um, Zone Seven has has removed a couple cement um, uh, structures. This one near Castle Golf Course on the right of the Laguna. We think Chinook salmon may end up spawning up in this reach. And now I've apparently turned the whole thing off. Um, and then uh, a, a couple of these um, concrete monstrosities in the Royal Mocho. This was permitted by CDFW, actually they were CDFG back then, the year before our organization formed. Luckily these kind of things aren't being permitted in the creek anymore. Um, Stony Brook Creek, which I talked about being potentially, um, you know, it's the lowest cold water um, spawning habitat really available for, for fish as they come into the watershed. Alameda County um, uh, dealt with two of the lower road crossing culverts. One of them they replaced with a bridge. One they uh, put these um, baffles in. You can see the bed load there um, with the seven double nut. Um, immediately, the winter immediately after these projects were completed, resident rainbow trout in Summer Creek moved up um, through both of these culverts and were documented the two years in a row. Um, using habitats immediately upstream. There's a bunch, there's a couple more road crossings and a bunch of private crossings and probably limited returns on habitat upstream of this, but 
um, something we'll be looking into. And then Caltrans, as part of um, their highway widening projects, um, just recently completed um, this fish passage, the, the culvert that was under Highway 84, where Stony Brook Creek empties into Alameda Creek in the middle of Niles Canyon, lower third of Niles Canyon, um, was replaced with this bridge, and I believe they've taken out this former road crossing sill as well. A couple more fish ladders that were put in quite a while ago. This was this part of a development project um, that realigned Arroyo Mocho and Arroyo Las Pesitas, um, and uh, Zone 7. This is the first project that California Department of Fish and Wildlife required fish passage for, um, and kind of signaled a new era in Alameda Creek um, going forward. So these, these are the, the fish ladders to nowhere, unless we can one day um, get Steelhead to go up uh, Arroyo Mocho and they would, they would use one of these fish ladders. <coughs> San Francisco built a very large fish ladder on the Alameda Diversion Dam. This is an upper Alameda Creek above, above uh, Small Regional Wilderness on the way to, to Ohlone Regional Wilderness. Uh, and you, of course, know about ACWD's fish ladders, um, recently completed. Those fish ladders by ACWD essentially open up the, the entire watershed below the three major dams to anonymous fish for the first time in over 50 years. Um, 72 was when, when the Bark Weir and Flood Hill Channel were completed. So, and we have evidence, I think, through the late 60s of, of salmon and steelhead. So, it's been, been 50 years in the watershed. Um, and then ACWD has also been um, pretty diligent about screening all of their diversions. I believe they're all screened now. Every, everything that's diverted um, out of the stream into those quarry pits. So our little smolts uh, won't end up, end up uh, in quarry lakes. The Calvary's Dam Rebuild Project, the seismically challenged uh, uh, Calvary's Dam, earthen dam built in the 19 teens, finished in 1925, actually collapsed while it was being constructed. Um, you can. This is from pre, pre, uh, you know, before the project was finished. But they basically rebuilt uh, an equivalent um, dam downstream in the Calgary Creek Gorge, um, re replaced it with the same uh, reservoir height, same capacity. Um, and as part of that project, um, we got San Francisco to um, do cold water flow releases, which have actually have been going for a few years now. Um, they've been releasing. Uh, a small pool of cold water from the bottom of the reservoir um, in summer and fall. So these are these are um, to enhance rearing conditions for for trout. And it's very cold water that comes comes out of Calaveras and it goes down to Upper Snow Valley. Um, and then when it hits the gravel quarry reach, most of those flows um, percolate down, and you don't have you don't have stream flow. But these are these are low flows, but they're cold enough water that um, since they've been releasing them in 2020. Uh, Rainbow trout have moved up into Calvary's Creek below the dam for the first time since San Francisco has been monitoring for over 20, over 20 years. And the warm water fish, the invasive bass and bullfrogs have all moved way downstream. So the cold water, um, it's, it's working. We have um, expanded cold water rearing habitat now about five miles below the dam there that's going to be also used by steelhead and will help us, help us rear steelhead. And then they also agreed to, as part of the Calaveras Dam, the Upper Alameda Diversion Dam, they put in that fish ladder, but they also put in a fish stream, um, which reduced their diversion capacity, and they agreed to minimum bypass flows. And the result is they, they divert about 40% less water, and they don't take all the peak off of the high flows. So a lot more flow coming downstream during big storm events, plus a, a minimum flow release during migration season. The reoperation and how they how they operate that diversion dam is going to absolutely influence fish migration downstream. Um, may determine whether or not steel they can get through the cascades of Little Yosemite. Um, it's certainly going to help smolts um, uh, get out easier. So just looking at the progress on the main stem, um, all the barriers are addressed um, or or in the planning stages. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there's still some small barriers on some of the northern um, arroyos, <coughs> Arroyo Mocho, or, uh, Arroyo de Laguna, um, and Stony Brook Creek, um, uh, three culverts that have been modified, and then um, we, we need to look into whether there's some private road crossings. 
that can be fixed and, and how much uh, access to habitat that will give us. So this, this is just showing um, the little red cancel circles or um, fish, former fish carriers that are either removed or laddered. Um, we've got the orange dots here are either remaining barriers or opportunities for restoration. And I'll talk about those five because that's kind of the next step. Um, uh, actually, we just heard the one at the mouth of the creek there um, is, the, is the salt pond restoration. Um, and we just heard that is moving forward. That's going to be our artificial estuary at the mouth of the creek where we hopefully can grow our smolts to where they can, they can go out um, at a competitive size and actually have a little bit of a survival rate out in the, the big bad bay in the ocean. Um, the, the one upstream in the uh, yeah, there we go. Um, in the flood control channel, you heard that about the Alameda County um, Public Works is looking at a sediment project um, that would also include um, a low flow fish passage channel through there, plus some habitat en enhancement in there, putting in some structures that provide cover, um, doing some uh, planting and uh, enhancing fish habitat. Um, this is a, in Niles Canyon, Lower Niles Canyon, this is a um, USGS gauging station weir, a cement port cement weir across the creek, actually owned by San Francisco, and it is failing. It's going to take itself out, um, one of these atmospheric rivers, um, and so um, at some point San Francisco is going to either replace that or, or notch it for fish passage. Um, PG&E crossing in the Snow Valley, I'll talk about that. And then this is Little Yosemite and Snow Region Wilderness, and I'll talk about both of those. So that this is, scoot through this, but the salt pond restoration, essentially we're looking at connecting the flood control channel on the creek to these restored tidal marshes so that um, steelhead, juvenile steelhead can get in there and grow big um, and escape high flows and, and those kind of things. And um, uh, I think we only have one connection point at, from the flood control channel at this point, one breach, but there's potential in the future to enhance, enhance uh, connectivity. Uh, that's the county uh, project I talked about. Here's the failing um, cement apron. It's actually, I went by this morning, it's actually worse. Um, that far bank is going to go um, in, in the next big atmospheric river. So this is a PG&E gas pipeline crossing. This is in the Snow Valley. Um, this is our last um, artificial, you know, human, human made barrier on Alameda Creek proper. Um, and this is in the Quarry Reach. And this is, you can see with the person on there, this is a massive, uh, there's a gas pipeline, but this massive cement mat that, that armors the pipeline. And we're gonna, we are working with PG&E to try to get them to bury this, this line and uh, remove the mat. Little Yosemite, there's a lot of debate over whether fish can be able to get through here um, to get into the upper watershed. You can see during low flow versus high flow conditions, it's a very different um, proposition. Um, the presence of the foothill yellow legged frog here, this is actually the best remaining um, breeding population in the East, or one of the only in the East Bay, um, has complicated um, efforts by San Francisco to kind of modify those cascades. So that's kind of on hold. So where we're looking at getting fish up to, um, uh, there's Stony Brook Creek um, in, in Lower Niles Canyon. Um, we think Steelhead will do well in there. Niles Canyon is, a, is an open question. <clears throat> if you look at it right now, it looks pretty good. It looks like a good trout, trout river. Um, we think Chinook Mace Lawn in there. Um, temperature is a big question, um, how, how the temperatures can be. Sinbad Creek in Sonol, um, we used to have Chinook, or sorry, salmon. Uh, either Chinook or Coho and Steelhead up in there. Used to be perennial, and now it, it no longer is, but could still be a Steelhead spawning area. Fish would have to get out of there and rear lower down in Niles Canyon in the summer. Lower, lower Red Laguna, um, we hope Chinook are gonna spawn in that section. This is kind of Castlewood downstream. Um, Snow Valley, uh, this is, this is um, we're getting in the area where San Francisco PUC monitors regularly. And this is Calaveras Creek, where I talked about just below the dam, where trout have moved up since the cold water releases. <clears throat> this is Lake Yosemite um, in Snow Region Wilderness, and just upstream is the diversion dam with the fish ladder. Um, if fish can get through Lake Yosemite and use the fish ladder, they can get into the headwaters of Alameda Creek, which is really great trout habitat. 
Uh, we you already heard about the, the Chinook that showed up um, and the lamprey. I, I just want to encourage people to appreciate the lamprey. If we have healthy lamprey, a lot of predators like these salmon, like these guys better because they're fattier, easier to catch, um, and they're going to buffer predation on our, our salmon and steelhead. Uh, we don't have an adult steelhead. We don't have any evidence of adult steelhead using the new fish ladder yet, but um, we're pretty sure they're going to. Um, and uh, looking looking forward to that day. We had the, we had the one juvenile small. Uh, I would be willing to wager we had adult steelhead go up this year, just based on the the, the, the sustained flows for the last few months. Or so, all right, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen, who's going to talk about our modern efforts. attention. 
So we hope that the, the salmon will also be attracting some attention. And then poaching. We did have a couple of poachers. Uh, they were down in the uh, rear area fishing during one of our atmospheric rivers when the Chinook salmon were swimming up every stream in the East Bay. We had a couple of poachers there. Um, fortunately, the park district has a, a trail manager in the area and he was able to talk to them. One of our volunteers um, contacted us and I think most of you probably know if you see a poacher, you don't really want to uh, approach them or uh, engage them, but you can call the uh, CDFW 1-800-CALTIP um, you know, to, to report poaching, and our local jurisdiction, um, the sheriff will come out and, and engage them. So we started using some paper field surveys and then uh, went to a survey app called Survey123. And um, Survey123 is a phone-based app, and we've started doing some on-the-ground trainings. We've partnered with uh, California Trout, Will, you want to raise your hand? If you have questions about California Trout, see Will afterwards. Uh, it's a conservation group. And we're also working with um, some flight clubs, the um, Diablo Valley, Tri-Valley, Grizzly Peak. Peter, can you raise your hand? Peter, raise your hand. If you have questions about Trout Unlimited, see Peter or myself. We're on the board of the John Muir chapter. We also do conservation work. And with these different agencies, and many of the public agencies that are here today, helping us with, with training and fish ID, um, things like invasive species, like the New Zealand lead snail, those kinds of things to be aware of, um, we're starting to get our volunteers up to speed. So briefly, I'll talk about uh, Survey 123. I became familiar with Survey 123 when I was working at a couple different uh, consulting groups and we were using it for nesting bird surveys. And I thought, hey, couldn't we adapt this to do like a habitat or fish observation um, type of um, data collection? So we started off with um, Survey123, and if you'd like a link, uh, there's two ways you can access it. One, you can download the app onto your phone, set up an account, username, password, and then you can use it that way, or we'll send you a link I uh, want to thank Alex and raise your hand from Sequoia for getting us up to speed on that, a, a link that you can use to just enter data on, on a laptop. So you download it, you open it, there's that sound again. <laughs> and once you're done, we have seven pages, you know, your name, weather, time, location, your observations. You upload it and it goes to the cloud and we can log into the site and download the data. Right now we have about 19 observations. Here are the Chinook salmon observations from last fall that, um, that I captured off of, off of our um, account. So now we're going to talk briefly about some drone surveys and uh, I want to thank Sequoia Ecological Consulting for helping us get some uh, drone surveys going and I'm going to turn it over to Jeff to briefly talk about the uh, drone survey efforts. Thanks, Ian. I'll keep this brief. Um, yeah, so Sequoia Ecological helped us. We, we realized that access issues in the House Canyon are a little challenging. It's a bit of a, 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 an empty box for us. We have no idea what's going on in there, where fish are. Once they get past the new fish ladders, um, uh, we don't know where they go. Um, and so we're trying to monitor the areas in the lower and middle watershed that aren't being monitored by, for example, San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. Once a fish, once fish get up to the confluence with Arroyo de Laguna, so uh, Snow Water Temple region and upstream, San Francisco regularly, routinely uh, does fish monitoring in those sections. So if steelhead or shrimp get up there and responding, or if there's reds or if there's juveniles, they're eventually going to detect them. Niles Canyon, Stony Brook Creek, Sinbad Creek, Lower Arroyo de Laguna, we, we have no idea unless, unless we find them or someone reports them. So we thought um, we would see if uh, drone technology could help us at least um, identify um, likely areas to, that, that Chinook might even show up and spawn, and we could focus some of our efforts there and try to figure out how to get access. So again, we broke, broke um, the watershed into reaches. Um, we're looking at the Niles Canyon reach, which is kind of the most successful, and immediately upstream of, you know, if we have fish going through the fish ladders, 
that's a, that's their first opportunity for for spawning. Um, and so you can see this is just a, a capture of a um, you know what the what the drone sees. Um, and Alex actually did the flights over two days in Niles Canyon, overcame some access and access uh, and formidable permitting requirements, <laughs> obstacles, and and got some drone flights. Um, and uh, covered about four miles of Niles Canyon. Um, the blue is, is the area covered. Um, the red, the red on this map, oh. the red is um, potential um, suitable uh, uh, spawning areas for, is this for Chinook or for Steelhead also? Yeah. also? For both, for both. Um, so this gives us um, a little bit of data points about, okay, maybe we want to get into, you know, we want to get into this area and see see what's going on here. So um, this is this is larger scale, but um, it was interesting to try to use this technology and see if it can help us um, uh, get an idea where to look. And we actually potentially could use this to to um, even spot reds. I think I think the, the imaging is good enough. Um, you, you know, if you got in the right time of year, you might actually be able to pick out reds. Um, And that's it, I think, yeah, that's it. All right, um, I think we've got time for questions. Yeah. People see those fish, they get really excited, and then they start to get interested in the stream. Um, and it's like John Muir said, when you try to pull one thing out, you find a hitch to everything in the universe. And salmon and steelhead are hitched to every ecological process in the watershed and everything we do to a watershed. So it's a great uh, entry point to talk to people about development, lifestyle choices, um, you know, <laughs> land management, everything we do effect eventually ends up in the, in the streams and the watershed and affects, affects those fish. And so, yeah, look forward to working with you guys 
on, on bringing them back and find them first. So, Jeff, uh, how do we go about the uh, those private properties and the culverts that need to be addressed? Uh, how do you get people to want to take on liability and, and fund those things? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to focus on Stony Brook and Sinbad Creek. We have a lot of members that live along those creeks. Um, we've gotten members to agree to give us access. It's easy to get people to say, oh yeah, I'd be interested in doing some kind of restoration project on my land. It's a lot harder to find someone who's like, I have this need and, and come, come, do a, you know, come, come do a project, a restoration project for me. So there's a lot of interest. Um, I think, um, I know uh, Ed with East Bay Parks is really interested in Sinbad Creek because of course that flows out of Pleasanton Ridge. Um, the idea that maybe we could get um, steelhead back up into, into Pleasanton Ridge Regional Park of Sinbad Creek would be pretty interesting. Um, like I said, they could spawn maybe get there. It's, it's great out of that. Uh, they couldn't rear that. They'd have to, they'd have to move downstream to rear. But, um, you know, Kilcare, um, all, all the folks that live in Snow along Kilcare Road, um, there's a lot of interest, but there's there's potential projects there. Um, I think once the fish start showing up, people are going to come out of the woodwork um, as far as what can I do. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a ton of, um, you know, uh, driveway crossings and private culverts and stuff there that um, I think there's a UC Berkeley study that identified um, just tiny, tiny little fish head passage barriers in someone's driveway. And those are the kind of things that, you know, work, working with us and the RCD and, and East Bay Parks um, in terms of permitting and um, bringing out volunteers and getting funding. I think, I think, I think we need to just start doing, we need to find a couple projects in those little watersheds um, have them be successful and then be able to point to the other residents like, hey, look, cost didn't cost them anything. They got a new, they got a new uh, driveway or bridge, and it's now fish running. So that's what we're going to focus on on those private private lands. Yeah, congratulations on all the success you've had in removing barriers. Is there any lessons learned from your success over you know, multiple decades that we should know about others wanting to do it elsewhere to remove fish barriers? Yeah, I have, I have two major lessons learned. Um, the first lesson is don't screw it up in the first place. Um, this, I mean, I, I picked, a, I deliberately picked a, a very urban stream for restoration because I grew up in East Bay and this is, Alameda Creek had the most restoration potential of any stream in the Bay Area for steelhead, which is why I took it on. But we've also just trashed our watersheds, you know, between development and every, everything, all the other bases we, we uh, uh, inflict on our, on our waterways. Um, the lesson really is um, uh, keep it pristine. And it, like groups that, that protect um, areas that are still wild and natural, really important. Don't let it ever get to the point where you're trying to repair it because it's complex and there's so many agencies that have infrastructure in the creek. Every, you know, there's so many competing interests. So don't screw it up in the first place, I guess, is the first major lesson. And the second major lesson I learned was this it's not it's not about the wildlife and the biology as much. It's it's um, restoration and sociology as much as anything. Um, it's changing minds and culture at agencies um, and, and getting agencies to accept and embrace restoration, and that's as, as much of the challenge as, you know, the biology um, part of it, so. Steven, any, any lessons learned? Not yet. <laughs> I'll get back to you. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, um, what are the minimum flows below Calaveras and also the diversion dam, and uh, how do they vary with droughts? And what's the water temperature regime before it's not no longer drought friendly going down the canyon? All right, I'm, I'm going to refer you to San Francisco for this because I'm probably going to screw it up. But so um, the the low flow um, releases from Calaveras are it's either between five or it's the low the low end is either five CF, CFS or seven, and the high end. I'm gonna get this wrong, but it's either 12, 12 or 19. And there are different flow schedules for different years, if it's a dry year versus a wet year. Um, so these are very low flows. Um, they're, they're not migration flows. They're, 
Um, I don't remember what the water temperature is. So it's really cold water. It's being pulled from pretty low in the, in the reservoir pool. And it stays cold. It stays cold. I don't know, I don't know the exact temperatures, but down to um, below the Snow Valley water treatment plant. So when you get to the gravel quarry reach, um, the temperature doesn't matter there because that those flows at that time of year are going into the gravels. They're not going to continue to surface flow. And it's, I mean, suitable, awesome cold water trout habitat up until that point. Um, what was the other part of the question? Uh, that, that so I guess what, oh, you're, sorry. what yeah. you're saying is that the, the summer trout rearing area stops itself. Stops uh, a little downstream of the Snow Valley water treatment plant. So the upper end of the where the quarries are along Calaveras Road. So you, when you drive into the Snow Regional Wilderness on the right, you see those quarries. Um, uh, the diversion dam, the minimum flow, I believe, is 50 CFS. Um, and I think that's an absolute. I'm not, I might have this wrong, but I think that's regardless of water year. Um, when there's when there's if it's available, they have to bypass. And then um, just because of the way they re um, operate it now, they, they just can't physically divert as much because the screens um, prevent them from diverting most of it. Um, so you, the the peak flow events, more of that water goes over the diversion dam, um, and that's that's a plug of water that's going to be available for. Uh, migrating fish and then also in the spring. I think that 50 CFS would be very important through spring, late spring for any smolts trying to move downstream. So they have combined flows, so they'll still run out of temperature when they get down to the... We don't really know. Um, yeah, no one's, no one's kind of tracking that water. I'm sure the water is, might have some data on water temperature um, down, down in the flood control channel, but the Snow Valley is definitely Water is warming. Anytime there's surface flow in the Snow Valley through the quarry reach, it's definitely warming up. Um, that that valley has been highly altered. Um, that's the place we're looking at um, doing doing riparian restoration. Hopefully, replanting sycamores along there and trying to get some some shade in there and, and habitat. So, um, but yeah, and then Niles Canyon. The issue with Niles Canyon um, in the summer, uh, in in I mean, we've got artificial flow in there because water is being delivered from the South Bay uh, aqueduct being delivered to down to ACWD downstream. So that's artificial water that wouldn't be there naturally and it's pretty warm because it's come through the South Bay aqueduct, which is just a, you know, it's like a, might as well put it in the oven before. Um, so that water is really warm, but it's also of enough quantity sometimes that um, fish, we've got fish here, trout that are surviving water that the literature says they shouldn't. And I guess the biologists think they're eating their way, you know, just with a high metabolism, they're eating their way, their way out of um, lethal temperatures. So if there's, if there's adequate food, work towards the southern end of the steelhead range. We actually have steelhead that tolerate warmer temperatures than we should. We want those, we want that really cold water, though. We want to grow fish. So. Great, that's about all the time we have, but uh, we're going to have one more presentation before break, so you can always catch Stephen and Jeff during the break.